If you have a Bible, I encourage you to grab it and turn to Acts chapter 2. Uh, this morning, I have the privilege of sharing from God's Word with you, Acts chapter 2. And I want to share a message with you this morning that I've entitled, Back to Basics. Back to Basics. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42. I'm going to read the passage to you. I'm going to be reading from the ESV, and then I'm going to pray for us. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you now, God, on this Lord's day, having been blessed already. Father, we are eager to hear from your word. Father, thank you for your word, thank you for your spirit, and thank you for the assembly of your people that once a week, everyone at this local church gathers together, assembles for the explicit purpose of worshiping you. Father, that is why we are here this morning. We are here to take our eyes and to focus on you. So many distractions, so many things that compete for our time, the busyness of this world, Lord, we take just a few moments now to hear from you. So would you bless the preaching of your word? Would you open our hearts and minds to receive what you have to say? Challenge us, change us, and grow us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning I have a question for you. I'm not trying to come out hot right out the gate, but I want to talk to you about your physical health for a minute. But how many of you would consider yourself to be living a physically healthy lifestyle. Well, we're Americans, and if we're honest, the reality is probably not many of us. I did some research this week on that topic, and I asked Google the question about what percentage does the internet say that most Americans are living a physically healthy lifestyle? Would you like to guess? It's very low. And so I saw an article from published by Health uh, day news, and the article grabbed my attention, as it probably would you, but it said that less than 3% of all Americans are living what they consider to be a physically healthy lifestyle. So that begs the question, of course, and that is, well, what is a physically healthy lifestyle? What is the standard that they use? And there's really four criteria that they list that if you were to meet these four criteria, you would be considered to be actively living a physically healthy lifestyle. And, and here they are, just in case you're curious and you'd like to work on your physical health this morning. But number one is a non-smoking lifestyle. So you don't smoke. Number two, you have a healthy, regular diet. So what you eat. Number three, you are maintaining a healthy amount of body fat. So your BMI, for example. And then number four, you are regularly exercising and keeping yourself fit and in shape. So, so how did you do? Did you, are you above average? Or are you like the most of us that probably fit into the 97% uh, of Americans that aren't living that physically healthy lifestyle? Now, most people, as you might assume, uh, probably don't meet all four of those criteria, but, but they meet one or two or three of those criteria. So hopefully you're at least working on one or two of those. We'd like to see you live a long, healthy, physical life. But you know that we're not talking about just physical health this morning. That's not our primary concern this morning. In fact, this morning I have another question that's similar to it, and that's this. Are you living a healthy spiritual life? Are you growing? Are you progressing? Are you maturing? Are you, to quote the Apostle Paul, training for godliness? 
Listen to what Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. He says, don't waste your time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. See, the reality of the Christian life is this, that we are constantly training. We're to constantly be growing and seeking to become more fruitful and more mature. It's a progressive goal. It's a goal that we don't meet in this life, but the goal is to eventually become more like Jesus. That's called sanctification. And each and every single one of us as believers are called to follow after Jesus so that we might become more like Jesus. But our growth doesn't terminate on ourselves. Our growth is not simply for our own spiritual benefit. I'm not asking you to take your growth seriously just for you. But in the Christian life, we grow so that we might make an impact on the lives of others. We grow and we pursue Jesus and we want to become like Jesus so that more stories like Chris just shared would happen again and again and again. The Christian life is not about you receiving the blessings of God and then living your own life your own way. Instead, God blesses you. God matures you. God grows you. He wants your spiritual health so that in return, you can make an impact on the lives of others. I mean, think about it this way. How in the world are we going to make a difference in this community if we're filled with immaturity, spiritual deficiencies, weaknesses, ignorances, faithlessness, sinfulness. Now instead, if we assemble together as His people, taking our faith seriously, growing in the Lord, pursuing Him, imagine the impact that we can have in Munford, Tipton County, Memphis, and the world. So how do we do that? What does it look like to grow up in the Lord? What does it look like to train? The reality is, We've got to get back to the basics. This morning, all I want to do with you from the book of Acts is I want to challenge you to get back to the basics. So much of what preaching involves is simply reminding you to put into practice the principles that you're already aware of. I don't believe that I'm going to be sharing anything new or novel with you this morning. Instead, I'm going to challenge you to get back to the basic fundamentals of the Christian faith, to actually put them into practice on a regular basis, and to see how the Lord grows you and matures you in this Christian life, this journey that we're called to do together. So do we have any examples of what that looks like in the Bible? I believe we do. Acts chapter 2 is the passage that we read. And let me remind you what's going on in the book of Acts at this time. So the apostles have been waiting on the promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told them not to go uh, and leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. Well, that day arrives in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, the festival of first fruits. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit falls and fills the apostles. And they begin to speak in tongues. They begin to preach Uh, Peter stands up and he preaches the gospel. He preaches the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And the Bible says that 3,000 men are added to the church that day. They repent of their sins. They're baptized. And now the early church has gone from 120 believers to 3,120. Could you imagine that type of revival, that type of spiritual awakening taking place. So now what? What are the apostles to do? How are they to take responsibility for these new believers? And the Bible says, beginning in verse 42, that they get back to the basics of the Christian faith. They devote themselves to growing up spiritually. And as a result of growing up spiritually, they begin to make an impact on the community so that we saw in verse 41 that 3,000 were added to the church. And then we're going to see at the end of verse 47 that the Lord is still adding to the church day by day those who are being saved. 
And what I love about the emphasis about this passage is that we see both and. We see spiritual growth on the one hand and numerical growth on the other hand. So that we never have to worry, we never have to choose whether we want to be a spiritually healthy, doctrinally deep church, a church filled with people who know their Bibles really well and love to read and love doctrine, really mature people, or should we be focused on reaching the lost and seeing people baptized and having new believers coming through the door? It's not either or, it's both and. We want believers who are mature, who know their Bible, who know Jesus and what it means to follow Him, and we want to reach the lost as well. And we want to see people converted to Christ as well. But if we're going to do that, if we're going to see that in this place, then we have to get back to the basics. All right, so what are those basics? What do we see here in Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47? I believe that we see three basic principles that the Lord is calling us to be reminded of and to put into practice every single day of our lives until Jesus comes again. If you have notes before you, here's the first basic principle. Number one, practice the means of grace. Practice the means of grace. What are the means of grace? There are five questions that I want to ask about the means of grace that I hope help us to remember what these are. The first question is, who practiced the means of grace? Who is to practice the means of grace? If you look at verse 42, Luke begins simply by saying, and they. Who are they? Well, simply put, they is a reference to the 3,000 who were saved. The new believers... The way that they grow in their faith is by practicing the means of grace. Now, that's obvious, I think. I think everybody here can understand and appreciate the fact that new believers are called to do things like read their Bible, pray, come to Bible study, do all kinds of things, worship. That's what new believers do, correct? However, it would be a false expectation to believe that that's just something that new believers do. If you look at verses 42 and verse 43 closely, then you will see that the the apostles are even present. In fact, I believe that the apostles are practicing these means of grace as well, which tells me it doesn't matter how long in the faith you've been around. It doesn't matter if you're a new believer. It doesn't matter if you've been a believer for five decades. The Lord has called you to grow. You never stop growing. And if you never stop growing, then you are constantly in a season of movement towards Christ. Active obedience to Christ. Putting into practice the means of grace faithfully over a long period of time. The new believers were practicing these. The apostles were practicing these. And I believe that by application, the Lord is calling all of us, every single believer in Christ, to take ownership of their faith. This morning, you are called by the Lord to seek to grow in Him by practicing the means of grace. Verse 44 says that all who believed were together. Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ by practicing the means of grace. So, That leads to the second question, and that's, well, what are they? What what do you mean by the means of grace? Well, uh, throughout the course of church history, different theologians have used different phrases to explain or describe what the means of grace are. Some people have said that they are habits of grace. These are the habits that every Christian ought to put into practice on a daily basis. Uh, More commonly, people call these the spiritual disciplines. Perhaps you've read a book before that have said spiritual disciplines for the purpose of godliness or spiritual disciplines for men and spiritual disciplines for women. The reality is there are only Christian spiritual disciplines. These are all the disciplines, the habits, the God-ordained means that Scripture lays out for us so that we might grow in godliness and become like Jesus. So that's an overall explanation of what the means of grace are, but specifically, what should we be giving our attention to on a daily basis or a weekly basis? And I believe that there are six that the early church 
was devoting themselves to. We'll actually see a seventh later, but I don't have it listed for you just yet. So what are they? Well, number one, Bible study. If you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, you and I have access to something that these 3,000 believers did not. We have the full canon of Scripture. And we have it not just in one version, not just in one translation, not just in one setting where you have to come to the church and use the Pew Bible. No, you have access to the Word of God like no generation before you. You've got the Word of God in writing. You've got the Word of God electronically. You've got the Word of God everywhere that your heart desires. The question is, does your heart desire the Word of God? Because access isn't the issue. Our sinful hearts is the issue. If we want to grow in our faith, it begins with a devotion to Scripture. These new believers gave themselves over to discipleship. The apostles inspired by the Lord were used to teach them, to equip them. And that's what leadership does. Leadership equips the people for the work of the ministry. And so it is our responsibility to intake Scripture, to obey Scripture, to know it, to devote ourselves daily to it. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Number two, fellowship. Verse 42 continues, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. What is fellowship? Fellowship is simply a partnership in the gospel. Biblical fellowship is more than just hanging out. Biblical fellowship is more than just two friends getting together. Biblical fellowship is coming together because you both know and love Jesus Christ. Because you are both believers. And you might not have anything else in common, but you have Jesus in common. And the blood of the covenant is enough to bring you together. What does biblical fellowship look like? It's Christ-centered. You serve together. You know one another. You worship together. There's a lot of food mentioned here in this passage. So at times, you're eating together. Verse 46, and day by day, attending the temple the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. Praise the Lord, you get to eat together and be godly at the same time. Eating together, worshiping together, building community together, showing hospitality to one another. Open your homes and invite somebody in from this church that you've never had over or that you haven't had over in a long time. Take them out to lunch. Take them out to dinner. Because we are called to grow, not simply in isolation, but in the community of the believers. Let me ask you a question. Do you know the people sitting on the pews? Do you know your leaders? Have you attempted to get to know anybody over the past six months? I encourage you to participate in fellowship, because if you want to grow, you're called to know other people. Bible study, fellowship. Number three, the observance of the sacraments. The observance of the sacraments, verse 42 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread. Now, we talked about how food is mentioned in this passage, but I believe that this is not simply a reference of them eating together. Rather, they are observing communion. They are observing the Lord's Supper. You and I have the opportunity to do that together tonight at 6 p.m., another advertisement for what we're doing together. What are we doing when we observe communion? We are remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are participating in another means that the Lord has ordained for us to draw closer to Jesus together as a congregation. And we're reflecting upon the promise that Jesus made that one day He is coming again. And the early church practiced communion together. But not only that, you remember what the new believers did after they responded to Peter's message? The Bible says they submitted to believers' baptism. So the first step in obedience when a new believer comes to faith in Christ, submitting to baptism, identifying with Christ and the body, practicing the means of grace 
involves practicing the ordinances, the sacraments that Christ instituted in communion and baptism. Number four, prayer. Finally, the passage ends with, verse 42 ends with, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, we will revisit this in more detail in my second point, but suffice to say this, the early church prayed together. I believe that they prayed as individuals and they prayed together as a church. And if we're going to grow and make an impact on this community, then we need to be a praying people. Number five, the Bible says they worshiped together. Verse 46, and day by day attending the temple together and breaking their bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. So regular corporate worship was another means that the early church gave themselves to for the purpose of growth and making an impact. Notice that it says that they were praising God and having favor with all the people. So there is a way to balance feeding the sheep and worshiping the Lord and coming together as believers and also not excluding those who don't belong to the assembly of our faith. We ought to be focusing on Jesus, growing in our faith, and reaching out to the lost all simultaneously. There is a way to do that. Worship. And then uh, the next one, the last one, evangelism. Evangelism. So notice that this passage is bookended by new believers coming to faith in Christ. Verse 41 says that 3,000 were added to the church that day. They were baptized. And then verse 47 ends with this phrase, the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Yes, God is sovereign. And yes, the Lord is the one who is active in doing the adding here. He is the one doing the saving here. However, he has chosen to use us in evangelism, in verbally proclaiming the good news as the means by which people come to faith in Christ. So these are the means of grace. Where do we do the means of grace? We do them in everyday life. Verse 46 says they did them in the temple. They did them in homes. They did them everywhere, anywhere, privately and publicly. So that you don't have to wait to come to church in order to serve the Lord and worship Him and grow in your faith. Yes, you do that here, but you also do that in your home. You do that in your car ride on the way to work. You do that at the office. You do that anywhere that you have access to the Word of God. You always have access to God in prayer. You only need a few things in order to focus on your growth in Jesus. So often, one of the excuses that we give, and it's a legitimate excuse, we just need to be creative, is the excuse of time. We say, we're busy We've got so much going on. We've got work. We've got families. We've got social lives. We've got football, basketball, ball, ball. We've got all kinds of ball. And the Lord today is calling us to be creative, to make an appointment with him and to keep an appointment with him. Just like nobody here who loves their vehicle would ever go without either washing it or taking it to get an oil change or whatever else that you do with your vehicle. So the Lord is saying, if you love me, Make an appointment with me and keep that appointment. Make it a regular daily occurrence. When, how, how often, verse 42, it says they devoted themselves. In the original language, the word devoted simply means faithfully, consistently, with perseverance, without giving up, which means that in order to grow, this requires faithful perseverance over a long period of time. This is not a sprint. This is a journey. This is a marathon. The Christian life continues until you die or until Jesus comes again. It requires faithfulness over a long period of time. Not just time alone, by the way. Everybody knows this is true. You can be a professing Christian for four, five, six decades and never grow in your faith. Because time alone is not enough for you to seek maturity in Christ. You need to be active in that time. You need to be faithful over the long period of time. 
and practicing the means of grace. Oh, may we not get to the end of our lives having been a professing Christian for six, seven decades and yet having the faith of an immature believer. It's never too late to start. It's never too late to restart. It's never too late to continue. Because I also hear another voice in the congregation that's telling me, Brother Brian, I used to do those things. I used to read my Bible. I used to do evangelism. I used to worship and pray. And the Lord is saying, start again. There is grace to start again. Start faithfully and persevere until I come again. Do it individually and do it in community. You need to take ownership of your own faith in the Lord. And you need the body in your life to help you shore up some things. We all have blind spots. We all need other people. We depend on others and we take our stuff home and we work on it on our, by ourselves as well. And then finally, we do it by the Spirit of God. We do it by the Spirit of God. We do it through grace-driven effort. These are called the means of grace for a reason. It is not legalistic for me to stand up here this morning and to challenge all of you to devote yourselves to practicing the disciplines that we are mentioning this morning. It's not, it's not legalistic because I'm not telling you to do these things to be saved. I'm assuming that if you're here this morning that you know the Lord and that maybe there's a few here that don't, but I'm talking primarily to believers this morning and I'm saying, brother and sister, grow in your faith by being devoted to these practices. We're saved by grace, and then we're matured by grace, and we're sustained by grace. And this is how the Lord gives us more grace, by practicing these disciplines individually and in community. So I've said a lot this morning, and that's only my first point, but I've got a question for you. How are you doing? Are you practicing? Have you been training are you active? If the answer is no, then restart. Then begin again. There's grace to start faithfully today and tomorrow and the days to come. If you are, then continue and help somebody else along. Encourage one another. Hold one another accountable. Be involved in someone else's life. If you are here this morning and you are faithful every day, to read your Bible, to pray, to worship, to listen to sermons, to try to grow in grace. And you're not reaching out to others who are not. You're not being a help to the body. You're not loving the body. We are called to do both and. To worry about our own faith and then to help others as well. How are you doing? Um, I cited some research earlier about physical health. Uh, in the state of America. I want to cite some research now from Lifeway Research, two different articles, one that talks about the health of the local church concerning their devotion to Bible study, to reading their Bible on a regular basis, and the other one concerning evangelism. So in the first article, Lifeway Research states that only 32% of church members read their Bible regularly. 32%. That means that one in three sitting in the pews this morning reads their Bible with any consistency, with any regularity. And we wonder why the church in America is in the shape that it's in. Brothers and sisters, it is good for you to come and to receive the teaching of His Word. But also necessary is for you to go home and to open up the Word of God and to ask Him to speak to you then as well. Do so tomorrow. Do so the next day. And then come back on Sunday. 32% regular and Bible reading. And then in the past six months, only 40% of church members have shared their faith with someone else. 40% in the past six months. When's the last time you shared the gospel with somebody? When's the last time you told somebody about the good news of Jesus Christ. It's really exciting to think about what the Lord could do in adding new believers to the congregation. 
but we will never see it here at Mumford Baptist, not with any regularity, if we're not taking seriously these means of grace in reading the Bible and sharing with others what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. Let's give ourselves to the means of grace. How do we do that? Number two, by relying on the supernatural. So we want to give ourselves over to practicing these spiritual disciplines, to these habits of grace, but we can't do so in our own strength. We'll get tired. We'll burn out. We won't grow apart from the supernatural intervention of Jesus, of the Lord. These believers understood that. They understood that if they were going to accomplish the Great Commission, that if they were going to do anything spiritually significant in their own lives and in the lives of their community, they were going to need to depend on something greater than themselves. They needed an outside source of power. And that outside source of power was none other than God Himself. They relied on the supernatural. What did that look like? Well, first of all, they didn't do anything apart from the Holy Spirit. If you look at chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, waiting, watching. What are you doing, Peter? Rally the troops. Get them all out there. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. You guys are wasting time. No, they were being strategic and they were being obedient. Jesus told them in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, and while staying with them, Jesus ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Why are they waiting? Jesus, there's so much to be done. The world is dying and go to hell. They, they need to hear the gospel. And Jesus said, I know, but they need to wait. They need to humble themselves. They need to depend. They need to rely. Because apart from the Holy Spirit, you can do nothing. And if this church is going to see believers grown up and new believers baptized, then we similarly need to rely upon the Holy Spirit. Because it's the Holy Spirit that distributes spiritual gifts. Acts chapter 2 verse 4 says that they began to speak in tongues for the purpose of sharing the gospel. Every believer here has been filled with the Holy Spirit and has been given a spiritual gift. That means everybody here has great power and great responsibility. Thank you, Ben Parker. We've been given a spiritual gift so that we might build up the church if you're not serving in some way, either in this church or outside of the church, you're wasting your gift. But you have a gift, and it's for the purpose of being used to build up the body. Number two, the Holy Spirit empowers our witness. Notice who is preaching here, and boldly, and powerfully, and successfully. An untrained, uneducated, ashamed fisherman who denied that he even knew Jesus three different times. And yet Jesus, being kind, compassionate, merciful, and graceful, restores Peter, gives him a position of leadership among the twelve, fills him with the Holy Spirit, and uses him to preach the gospel on the day of Pentecost so that great revival breaks out. Only the Holy Spirit can change a man's life to do that and empower him to cause spiritual awakening and revival. But that's the promise that was given in Acts 1 verse 8 anyways. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you're going to be my witnesses here and everywhere. Rely on the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit can do things that you and I cannot. Number three, the Holy Spirit brings conviction of sin. Acts chapter 2 verse 37. The Bible says that these new believers were cut to heart. I believe that that is a reference to the conviction that God brings when someone hears the gospel and they respond in repentance and faith. That is something that none of us can do. No preacher here is gifted in that area. We're not spiritual heart surgeons. We simply are vessels. We're mouthpieces. We open the word, we preach the word, and we leave the rest to God. Say, God, I can't change them. Will you change them? God, I can't cut them to heart like it requires. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. We bring the Word. Similarly, 
Verse 41 says that they're baptized, they're added to the church, and that's because the Holy Spirit causes regeneration. So after conviction of sin, their eyes are open and faith is produced in their life. And the Bible says that they're caused to be born again, as 1 Peter chapter 1 says, like we heard this morning. The Holy Spirit brings dead men to life. We want to see believers, we want to see lost people become believers. The only way that's going to happen is if the Holy Spirit brings spiritual awakening. And then remember that that's not the end of the journey. That's the beginning of the journey. So the Holy Spirit brings regeneration. And then the Holy Spirit causes sanctification. So they're born again. And they begin to grow. Well, how do we grow? In addition to devotion to the means of grace, the Holy Spirit begins to sanctify them. The Holy Spirit begins to mature them and grow them in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's another example of both and. Do we take responsibility of our own faith? Yes. Does the Holy Spirit cause maturity and sanctification of our life? Yes as well. It's both and. The Holy Spirit causes the fruit of the Spirit. If you notice there in verses 43, 44, 45, and 46, the Bible says that there is unity, generosity, love, and joy, and peace, all of that produced by the Holy Spirit. And then finally, the Holy Spirit provides wisdom and direction. Brothers and sisters, this church needs lots of wisdom and lots of direction, particularly in this moment. And the only, we, the only way that we will be successful in receiving that wisdom and that direction that we need is by seeking God's face and relying upon the Holy Spirit. Over in Acts chapter 13, we have an example of how the church at Antioch sought the face of God and relied upon the Holy Spirit for that wisdom and for that direction. Let me read Acts 13 verse 1 to you. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers... And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Do you see what happened at the church at Antioch? Three three spiritual disciplines that they were giving themselves to. Worshiping, praying, and here's a new one, fasting. They were giving themselves over to seeking the wisdom, illumination, and direction from God. And the Bible says somehow, I don't know how it happened, but somehow the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work of the ministry that I have for them. This evening we have another opportunity to ask the Holy Spirit, to speak and to say clearly, set apart for me these men that I have for this particular work of ministry. Praying and fasting and worshiping. Again, this is basic Christianity. I don't know if it feels like I'm preaching something that's like a high radical standard, but I'm not, am I? I'm simply preaching the basics of our faith. Why do we think that we can be effective without this? We can't be. May the Lord humble us and cause us to rely more fully, more deeply upon the supernatural. In 1854, uh, the New Park Street Chapel in London, England, received and called its new pastor. Uh, That new pastor would rise to prominence and fame, so much so that today his sermons are still read, his books are still read, whole colleges are named after him. Uh, That church would later change its name to the Metropolitan uh, Tabernacle. The name of the pastor, you may have heard of him, uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Charles Haddon Spurgeon has been given a nickname over the years, uh, the Prince of Preachers. And that's because he did preach biblically faithful, Christ-centered, evangelistic sermons. And um, thousands of people would go and listen to Charles Spurgeon preach. But you know, if we had Spurgeon up here this morning and we were to ask him, Spurgeon, what is the secret 
to your success? How did you go from a congregation that you inherited, which had 313 members on your first Sunday and just a handful of deacons, to exploding in this spiritual and numerical growth in a city like London, England, which is not too different from, say, New York City or somewhere here in America. And Spurgeon would tell us what he showed a handful of college students that once came to visit him at the tabernacle. They came for a tour, and Spurgeon decided to give them that tour, and and he asked them a question. He said, young men, would you like to see the heating room of the church? And the college students said, "Um, we probably want to see your library, but I guess we can go see the heating room of your church. And so he took them to a room uh, in the bottom floor, and when they opened the door, the college students saw 700 different members of the church quietly on their faces before the Lord, praying to God. You see, I believe that ultimately what made Charles Spurgeon successful, what makes any church successful, is not necessarily who you put behind the pulpit, but the God that they serve and so desperately rely upon. Brothers and sisters, The explosive growth that the book of Acts experienced and the explosive growth that the Metropolitan Tabernacle experienced is the same explosive growth that you and I can experience, not because Peter is behind the helm, not because Spurgeon is behind the helm, but because God is behind the helm. He is the head of the church, and you and I have that same access to Him. We have to rely upon His providence. This section of Scripture, verse 43 and verse 47, it's a section that I like to call miracles, missions, and math. What does the miracles being performed by the apostles, the missions that's being done by the entire church, and and the math, the addition that we see at the end of the passage all have in common? The one common factor is God. God is involved in all of it. We will not accomplish anything here of any eternal significance apart from relying upon Him, seeking Him. And that is simply basic Christianity. We've got to get back to the basics. We've got to practice the means of grace. We've got to rely on the supernatural. And then lastly, briefly, we have to join God on mission. You see, here's the truth. God is on mission. Whether or not you and I are on mission is is really irrelevant. That will not prevent God from being on mission. He's always been on mission. On mission to redeem a people for himself from every nation, every tribe, and every language. He's been busy and active and involved since the very beginning. And today, God is still busy, active, and involved in redeeming a people for His glory. He has invited us. He has commanded us. He has chosen to use the church. He has chosen to use you, and He has chosen to use me. He has chosen to use us to accomplish His redemptive purposes in this world. God doesn't have to use you, but God has chosen to use you. He has chosen to use you to make disciples, to preach the gospel, to build the church. Make no mistake about it. Jesus said, I will build my church, but I'm going to use these little tools to do it. Untrained, uneducated, fishermen, tax collectors, and the rest school teachers and carpenters, accountants and lawyers, doctors and preachers and retired people and all of these different kinds of people, men, women, children, young adults, and yes, old folks, everyone, everyone together, because ultimately it is the Lord using us. In what way is the Lord trying to use us? Two ways in particular. Number one, he wants you to serve your local church. The Lord wants you to serve your local church. Verses 44 through 46, we read these words. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. 
And they were selling their possessions and belongings, distributing the proceeds to all who had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. The believers taking care of other believers. By the way, the only way that you can know that someone has needs is if you are invested in their life. Unless they make that need known publicly on Facebook or somehow they contact the church, you will not know that someone is struggling unless you ask them, unless you know them and they open up to you. This is why community is necessary, but we all have needs in this place. Physical needs and spiritual needs, needs that require money, needs that require services, and needs that simply require an ear. There have been so many times in my life where I just needed a friend. I just needed a brother that would listen to me, that I could talk to, that I could ask for advice for. And praise the Lord, I've always had that here at this church. And I've been blessed by someone sitting across the dinner table from me just listening to me. You can bless somebody as well just by sitting across the table from them and just listening to them. Serve your local church. And number two, don't forget to reach out to the lost. Reach out to the lost. Again, the lost world is just like the church world. There are physical needs and there are spiritual needs. Physical needs that are being met through the food pantry and other ministries and spiritual needs that are met by you through faithful evangelism. Just like Peter got up and he was street preaching. Street preaching is so taboo in our culture these days, isn't it? Like if I said, hey, let's go and get a box and stand on Beale Street and preach the gospel wide open, who would join me? Probably no one. In fact, somebody would probably try to convince me not to do it. Say, brother, is that really the most effective way for you to share the gospel? Is that really the wisest way for the good news of Jesus to be, to be spread? And I, and I would just say, like, I like the way that I do evangelism better than the way that you're not doing evangelism. <laughs> like, let's, let's share the gospel then. Let's get creative. Let's do it through kids ministry. Let's do it through youth ministry. Let's do it through a food pantry. Let's do it through a car wash. Let's do it through um, going to the homeless shelter. Let's do it in the jails and the prisons. Let's share Jesus because people need Jesus. People need to know that God created them and God loves them and that God loves them so much that even though they sinned against him, that though, though they broke his heart by rebelling against them and breaking his laws, God doesn't want to condemn them. God doesn't want to send them to hell, but God is a just God and he will punish sin. So what did God do? God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for them. Jesus died on that cross receiving the punishment due sin. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. And the response to the gospel is trusting Jesus, following Jesus, turning from your sin, repenting of your sin, and the Lord will forgive you of your sins. The Lord will make you new. The Lord will accept you into His family. And then, most amazing of all, the Lord will use you to tell others about the good news of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we have an opportunity to be used by the Lord and to see amazing things done in our world. But it's going to take getting back to the basics. So will you devote yourself by the power of the Holy Spirit to seeking the Lord and reaching out to others and just see what the Lord might do? Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we come to you now, God, and we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the example of these believers that have challenged us 2,000 years later. Father, I pray for faithfulness and I pray for blessing over the life of this church, God. We were given an example of the kind of difference that we can make in someone's life when Chris read that note. Well, God, I pray we would continue to see that example. A new school year is about to start. Uh, people are in great need physically and spiritually. I pray, Father, that we would be faithful and not miss out. But use us, God. Use us to make a difference, I pray. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.